joining me on Off the Record today is writer and historian Patrick French, who is in India for the launch of his latest book, India, A Portrait, which is a thoroughly researched, highly compelling and multi-layered book. Uh, welcome back to what seems to be your most favorite country in the world. Anna, is it my favorite country in the world? That's the question. Do you love India or are you fascinated by it? Because I see it as two different emotions. I think I'm more fascinated by it than I love it. Uh, you know, to me, the idea of being an Indophile is a term that I wouldn't want to apply to myself because, you know, if you think how many things that there are that are not right, you know, whether it's meeting somebody who's been chained up in a quarry for two years, or whether it's the kind of problems that people in different communities face, I don't think it can be a feeling of love, but it is a feeling of fascination. And I also think that sometimes when you have people saying they love India, what they actually mean is that they want to exoticize India. And the strange thing is I've never seen the country in that exotic way, but I've always been fascinated by it. So you must answer that question then. Do you, is this your most favorite country in the world? I think possibly it is, yeah. Although. I don't feel like every day of the week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like the way the book's been sort of compartmentalized. Mm. The first section is called Rashtra, the second is called Lakshmi, and the third is called Samaj. So how and why did you conceive of such a division as it were? Well, I thought in order to explain everything that's happened in the last 20 years, the way that the country has changed so much, even while many things have stayed the same, that I had to give some political history I had to explain that background, whether it was for younger Indian readers for whom all those events seemed a long, long time ago, or for foreign readers who would not be familiar with them at all. So in order to write about economics, in order to write about the wealth, whether it's people lacking it or having it, in order to write about social change, I had to first of all uh, zip through uh, the political history. So I was wondering if we could compartmentalize our talk as well, because it's such a sprawling book. I thought if in the first segment of the show, if we could talk about Rashtra, yeah. which is the history of modern India and the predominance of dynastic politics in our country. Oh. So my first question is based on a statement made by a Delhi lawyer while you and he discussed Nehru and his ideals. And the lawyer said that the problem with India is Indians. The rules are all there, but nobody obeys them. Indians don't go by the book. And I think I would agree with him. So do you think I'm being cynical? Because in the course of your research, you must have met a lot of people in my age category in their late 30s. What is the mood? Hmm. Well, I, I, I think that overall the mood is optimistic in that people can now have expectations or aspirations or ambitions that their parents or grandparents could never have had. And of course, that leads to social pressures. It leads to people of the older generation suddenly feeling that younger people seem to be uh, disrespectful or uh, that it's unfair that they should be earning a salary that's maybe three times higher than their father. All of these things shake up the society. But equally, there is a sense of possibility and aspiration, which extends to most parts of the country. Uh, I don't think it's only a small elite who have that. I think there's a middle class revolution going on in India. And um, talking about the section, there will be blood. You talk about the violence after Indira Gandhi's death. Mm. And I'd like to read a quick paragraph. For days, mobs of rioters roamed the streets, looting homes and setting people alight with kerosene. And only in Calcutta did the state government, run by Jyoti Boshu, make sure that no pogroms took place. More than 3,000 Sikhs died and three days passed before Rajiv Gandhi decided to call out the army to stop the slaughter. What you go on to say is that it was to develop into a political tradition. After a small genocide, after a disaster, after a scandal, no leader would be held accountable. That's really hard hitting. And two pages before that, when Rajiv Gandhi became the Prime Minister, you say, in an ideal world, the premiership of the largest democracy on earth should not be an entry-level appointment. <laughs> Nor that was a you... good line, wasn't it? Okay, I'd forgotten that one. Okay. <laughs> Nor are you flattering about Sonia Gandhi. There are some very unflattering anecdotes. You know, I thought I was quite nice about Sonia Gandhi. <laughs> so I get okay. the feeling oh. that the Congress does not enchant you by any stretch of the imagination. Well, I don't know. I mean, there are some things about the Congress which are good. I think there's a, a continuity That's in my Congress. Question. Manmohan yeah. Singh, I think, is a truly remarkable prime minister. 
anything else about the Congress that you like? That I like. What else yeah. do I like about the Congress? You know, one of the strange things is that I, you know, I did this massive uh, survey of how every Lok Sabha MP had come into politics. Did they get there on their own achievement or because their mother or father gave them the seat? Mm. And, uh, you know, the, the, the outcome of that survey was depressing in that, you know, nine-tenths of Congress MPs under the age of 40 are hereditary. And yet there are reforms being made by Rahul Gandhi in the Youth Congress to allow people to come in really from at any, you know, at any point and, and contest freely. And if he extends that to having the idea of open primaries for Lok Sabha seats, which uh, I think he probably intends to, you could have quite a rapid reform and turnaround of Congress. But there again, I find what you say contradictory because you defend Rahul Gandhi saying that uh, fundamentally he is well motivated and the hmm. job chose him. We're talking about dynastic politics. You say the job chose him, he didn't choose the job. Yes. Because I find that con uh, contradictory. It's, al it's always like that in dynastic politics. No, Pe These people are chosen for the job. Well, I think that what he wants to do is to alter the mechanisms of how politics works inside the Congress party. It's a calcified organization and he's trying to reform it from inside. And I think probably that the process is what interests him rather uh, than purely uh, you know, the, the attainment of personal so power. So you do see merit there in him? I, I think he's a very interesting politician. He's very understated. He's not interested in grandstanding. He's not interested in uh, you know, I, I think in, in his view that, uh, if you like, public perception is not important. It's the mechanisms that count. And, uh, you know, it's an unusual approach, and we'll see whether or not it's successful. Yeah, moving on to the next section, centrifuge, yes. where you talk about the BJP and the mm. RSS. You say that the Hindutva movement was too important a force to dismiss it only as ignorant bigotry as almost uh, all liberal commentators tried to. But every time you sought to move beyond this and understand it better, you came up against the irrational. Mm. So do you think we'll always have coalition politics? Because you also look at other minor parties which are significant as well. Yes. But do you think, do you see that we will always have coalition politics in our country? Well, but you know, the point about the BJP is that I think many people would like a centre-right party where progress in, within the party was based on merit. And it's almost as if the BJP has not turned into the kind of party that it could be. And, uh, you know, essentially coalitions are probably here to stay. Uh, it's, been, it's been 20 years almost since uh, one party on its own has been able to, you know, effectively form the government. And I think in the future there will always need to be coalitions at the centre. And Indians will have to learn how to manage that over time because it's never going to go away. And that, in a way, is the wonder of democracy. You know, the fact that the founding figures of the nation chose to have a universal democracy meant that all sorts of regional and caste-based parties would come up and that all those different groups would have to interact with each other at the centre in order to form the government. So, you know, the days when the Congress could be elected and could control everything are clearly long gone. We have to move on to the next yeah. section, which is uh, Lakshmi, which looks at the economic progress in the country, the challenges, the successes and the failures. And there are some very interesting stories in this chapter. We'll talk about that after a short break. I'm in conversation with writer and historian Patrick French.